Hi everyone, just giving a few minutes for people to join. Hello, a uh, very warm welcome to the webinar from the Science-Based Target Initiative Finance Team. My name is Hasina Sola, and I'm a financial institution's target analyst at the SBTI. Thank you for attending today. We hope to bring you a high-level but informative session. The webinar is focused on three drafts, um, the financial sector resources that are currently open for public consultation. Today, we will provide a summary of each of the documents and how we would like you to get involved in the consultation process. Before we get begin, a few housekeeping rules. Um, so this event is being recorded and will be available on the SBTI YouTube channel. A recording together with a copy of the slides will also be available on our website. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please type them into the Q&A box that you can access on the bottom of your screen. We are also joined today by behind the scenes from colleagues across the SBTI who will be answering as many questions as possible in writing. If we don't get the opportunity to cover all the questions, we will respond to as many as possible on our website and social media channels. Um, so this webinar will run for about 60 minutes and our agenda will cover an introduction to the SBTI and our finance team, an overview of the documents and the consultation process. We will then delve in and provide more insights into the three drop documents. And finally, a chance for your questions to be answered by our speakers and for anyone who has just joined, you can submit your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We'll work together to answer as many questions as possible during the presentation in the Q&A and in writing. Um, so for today's webinar, we have uh, myself, uh, as well as Nate Aiden, our finance lead, um, Owen White, who will be speaking on, who is a senior technical manager and will be speaking on the FINS, work and Howard Shi, who is also senior technical manager, will be speaking on the near-term updates. And I'll leave it to Nate. Wonderful. Thank you, Hasina, for um, starting the webinar and thank you everyone for joining today. So before we get into the three consultation drafts, I will just give an overview of SPTI Finance's work and uh, sort of where we're coming from with these documents. So as uh, most folks on the webinar know, the SBT initiative is a collaboration between CDP, WI, WWF, and the UN Global Compact, and we launched in 2015. When we launched, there was already a lot of interest from financial institutions in setting science-based targets, but there was an understanding of how to do this, uh, covering their scope three emissions, which have always been central for science-based targets. And so in 2020, we launched our near-term finance guidance, uh, what we call the framework. And that's the basis of the science-based targets that we have assessed so far among financial institutions. Uh, and that framework has um, defined best practice among financial institutions globally for setting science-based targets. Since we published that framework, you can see on this slide um, some of the things that we've published subsequently. So two years ago, we published our corporate net zero guidance, uh, which is being used to assess companies' net zero targets. And then last year, we published a foundations document for financial institution net zero target setting. And that um, is the basis for some of the work that we're talking about today. We also published some guidance for financial institutions to coordinate their TCFD reporting with their SPT process. Uh, and so those are some other resources that are available. And then on the 15th of June last month, we published these three consultation documents that we'll be talking about today. Before we get, go into those, the next slide just gives an overview of sort of where we are. So you can see um, we've been growing very quickly, more than doubling each year for the past few years. Now we have um, 5,500 companies and financial institutions with public commitments to set science-based targets of which about 3,000 have gone through the process and met our criteria. 
And you can see that the financial institutions component of that is, is smaller due to that lag that I mentioned earlier in terms of the, the methods and criteria for financial institutions. But we have more than 220 that have committed publicly, they're listed on our website, and 64 that are um, that have targets that have met our criteria and gone through the validation process, which is described here in the, the figure to the right in terms of that framework. So there were four components to the framework that we published in 2020. The first was a set of three different methods that we use for bottom-up asset class-based approach uh, to, um, to specify what financial institutions need to do. If they don't have finance emissions data, how can they go about setting targets? And so the first method is what we call the sector decarbonization approach. It's a set of physical intensity methods. So for example, for electricity generation project finance, that provides gram CO2 equivalent per kilowatt hour electricity generation emissions intensity that can be followed for that target setting. Uh, likewise for buildings. Um, the second method is what we call SBT portfolio coverage, which is the idea that the financial institution engages with their investees or clients to get them to set science-based targets. And the third method is what we call temperature rating. And it's again, where the financial institution engages with their counterparties to have them set targets. And then those are then given a temperature rating, which can then be aggregated up to the portfolio level. We then developed criteria based on these three methods. We also published an open source temperature rating tool so that anyone can see how that works and apply the temperature rating to their portfolio. And finally, we published a 170 page guidance document, which explains these first three components and also includes eight case studies from financial institutions that are actually using these resources against their, their portfolios to assess how it actually works. So this is um, the sort of background. And the next slide just gives an overview of the three documents that we released last month. Again, these are consultation drafts, so they're by no means final documents. The purpose of the webinar here today is for us to give an overview of these three documents to you and then to hear your questions and feedback and also to direct you to our feedback survey where we will be um, trying to understand uh, broader views on these three documents. So the first is an update of that 2020 framework. We call it near-term V2. And the purpose of this update is to clarify some areas that <clears throat> weren't completely elaborated or stipulated in the 2020 uh, version. The second is to increase ambition, <clears throat> where we're bringing it up from well below two to 1.5 degrees, uh, and also reeling back the um, time frame from five to 15 years, which was the original SPTI time frame to five to 10 years, which is the one that we're using across the initiative now. The second document is the concept framework and initial criteria for the financial institutions net zero, what we call FIN standard. And um, this has a lot of new thinking, it's a bit more holistic. Uh, and Owen will talk through some of the details here. And the third is the Science-Based Targets Initiative Fossil Fuel Finance Position Paper. And this includes criteria for financial institutions to cover their fossil fuel related investment, lending and facilitation activities. Uh, and this builds on the foundations paper that we published last April, uh, April of 2022 that is. And I will describe that in more detail farther on down the webinar. In terms of how these three documents relate to each other, the near-term framework exists presently. It's the basis for the current validations that we're doing and have done and it will continue to be in effect. Um, the fossil fuel criteria are being introduced as a new fourth option for financial institutions to cover their fossil fuel related investment and lending activities. And it will feed into both the near-term framework and the, uh, the FIN standard. And the FIN standard is uh, something that's entirely new uh, as, as with the fossil fuels component. Um, and this is the initial uh, conceptual draft. We expect that there will be additional drafts before we have an implementation version of the, uh, the FIN standard. In the long run, we expect the FIN standard to absorb the near-term framework. However, uh, there's gonna be some steps between here and there. And for the foreseeable future, we expect that the near-term guidance will be valid and will continue to be used for 
developing SPTs by financial institutions and assessing those SPTs against our criteria. The next slide uh, just brings us over to the near-term guidance. So uh, I'm happy to pass it over to Howard Shee. Thanks, Nate. Um, so as Nate mentioned, the SPTI launched the first version of the near-term financial sector guidance in 2020. Uh, since then, it has now been used by over 60 financial institutions to set validated near-term science-based targets. And last month, as you, as you all know, we published a draft version two for a 60-day public consultation. So in this version, we have five criteria changes, which we'll go over in the next slide, um, as well as other clarifications and revisions to improve interpretation and application and to aid target setting. The clarifications primarily concern definitions, coverage criteria, use of methods and target options, as well as an updated target language template. Um, a full summary of these updates can be found in Appendix G of the near-term guidance. So the first of the five criteria changes is to the timeframe of scope one and two targets. We are proposing a shortening in timeframe from five to 15 years to five to 10 years. Uh, this is in line with the corporate net zero standard um, and as we need to action to be taken quickly. The second, third, and fourth criteria changes that are proposed are to increase the minimum ambition of scope one and two targets, as well as scope three, category 15, SDA, and temperature rating targets. Um, and for temperature rating, this is for portfolio scope one and two emissions. Um, so we're proposing to increase the minimum ambition to 1.5 C, which again is in line with the corporate criteria. Uh, in terms of temperature rating, again, um, the minimum ambition for scope, portfolio scope one, two, and three temperature scores will increase from 2 C to well below 2 C. Um, so here we're, we're all pushing for more ambitious targets in line with the temperature goals of the Paris Agreement. And then finally, uh, the SDA for the fossil fuel sector is under development. So in the meantime, we are adding the fossil fuel finance targets approach as a new target setting option to help cover financial activities in the fossil fuel sector. So this criteria would only be relevant for FIs that choose to use this approach to set targets under the near term guidance version two. Uh, while it will be proposed as general criteria for all FIs under the FIN standard or the net zero standard for FIs. So more details on this particular set of criteria will be covered in the fossil fuel finance position paper section of this webinar. So on this slide, um, we have uh, several clarifications in addition to uh, the criteria changes um, that are made throughout the draft guidance to align with corporate criteria again, or to address questions that have arisen during target validations or in our FI community forum. So in particular, we've updated the target language template um, which is provided in the version two draft. And this is to help ensure consistency and comparability of targets. So for example, this includes an option to set a low emissions intensity maintenance target for electricity generation project finance and real estate assets. So for example, FIs that meet certain strict conditions that are listed in the consultation draft can commit to maintain their base year emissions intensity of their portfolio through 2030. Now this maintenance target aims to accommodate FIs that have already achieved at a portfolio level, the emissions intensity required to align with the 2030 sector intensity level in a 1.5 C pathway. Um, so, so this arose during target validations from FIs that have already done this. Uh, also in the target language template, we include language for transparency purposes regarding the breakdown of required, optional, and out-of-scope activities in the FI's portfolios. 
uh, as well as any exclusion of asset management activities by banks. So this provides more information to external stakeholders uh, to see how much of an FI's activities are being covered by targets compared to what is required. So for example, uh, FI could potentially cover 40% of its activities, uh, but only because uh, the other 60% is out of scope. So this additional disclosure provides important context. Uh, on the next slide here, we see uh, some additional key clarifications. Um, so first, targets can be set on loan outstanding or loan commitment amounts. Um, we've received many questions uh, from banks mostly about this. Um, so we wanted to address this explicitly. Um, second, coverage requirements are based on the underlying asset class. So the requirements apply to securities in both the trading book and banking book. Third, investments managed on behalf of third parties under discretionary mandates are required, while investments administered under advisory or execution only mandates are optional. So this reflects the influence principle, um, which has been communicated many times, but may not have been widely understood um, from just reading the previous guidance version. Uh, fourth, for the avoidance of doubt, um, all FIs other than banks may must include their asset management businesses in their target boundaries. And fifth, uh, coverage requirements are again, based on the underlying asset class. So for investments via funds, FIs must set a target on the underlying holdings. So for example, if a FI is invested in an ETF that is invested in corporate and sovereign bonds, then the FI must set targets on the corporate bonds part. The consultation draft has additional details, uh, including, um, so on the previous slide, uh, we have a, another list, um, and this is to align with corporate criteria again. Um, it covers several topics on minimum target boundary coverage, um, calculating minimum target ambition, scope to accounting, zero scope one emissions, base years, and emissions inventory. Uh, so again, I know I, I ran through all of that quite quickly. So again, a full summary of these updates can be found in Appendix G of the near-term guidance. Um, so we invite you to read through this after the webinar and provide any feedback in the consultation survey. So one last key area to know, uh, Table 5.2, which provides minimum coverage requirements. Uh, this has been revised with more granular specifications for each asset class to help address the many questions we have received on this. So requirements are now more clearly outlined by sector, um, listed versus private and corporate versus SME portfolio companies, uh, short versus long-term and direct investments versus investments via funds. So for example, the 67% minimum coverage requirement for long-term corporate loans has been amended to include the minimum coverage requirement for loans to fossil fuel companies and real estate asset loans. So this amendment along with the addition of the fossil fuel finance targets approach is meant to help address FI challenges that have been raised. Um, a separate at real estate asset class has also been explicitly added um, to give more clear direction uh, in terms of the coverage requirements there. Um, again, I know this is a lot of information, so just to repeat, uh, a full summary of updates uh, in the near-term uh, guidance can be found in Appendix G. In terms of next steps, we plan to publish the final near-term guidance version 2 following the 60-day consultation period. Uh, it will be available to be used for target setting immediately after that publication. Uh, and then it will become compulsory uh, as the near-term FI framework six months after that publication of the final version two. So we welcome all of your feedback on these changes in the consultation survey which is now open until August 14th. You can access the survey uh, by scanning the QR code uh, on this slide. So for the near-term guidance version two, the 
consultation questions mainly relate to the five proposed criteria changes and some of the key clarifications and revisions that were just mentioned in the previous slides. A comment box is also available for any issues not covered in these consultation questions. So with that, I'll turn it over to Owen uh, to share details of the FINS initial criteria consultation draft. Thank you, Howard, and hi, everyone. Yeah, so I will now um, provide an overview of the uh, net zero standard that we are developing. Um, and those of you familiar with our uh, corporate standard work will kind of see a lot of similarities in the development process where this work is very much designed then to complement and update our near-term guidance to add those crucial uh, long-term targets and neutralization uh, components. So a lot of the early work that's gone into this um, was published last year as part of our foundations paper, which looked at things like you know, the definitions uh, of net zero uh, at the portfolio level and the various components that should be captured in credible net zero targets. Um, the standard or the consultation that we published uh, last month then has expanded on these to add in a lot of those core criteria that we see as relevant and also then add in some of the more conceptual elements around methods and coverage that we want to uh, include in this standard. It's really designed as an approach that will allow more flexibility going forward to integrate other types of methods um, as they develop as well. So what we want to do today is, is run through some of those kind of core criteria and the key elements of the framework that we're looking to get feedback on. As Nate mentioned a little bit earlier, with all of the, the work that we produce, the SPCI, the standards usually have four key components, um, criteria, methods, guidance, and tools. The function of this um, consultation draft is primarily on those criteria front. So they are the core you know, qualitative and quantitative criteria that we would expect for near and long-term targets. In parallel now, we are working on um, methods and guidance that will complement this, and they will really determine then the different types of metrics that financial institutions can use when establishing those near and, near and long-term targets. And this will be published shortly alongside other tools that can help uh, FIs then to uh, actually establish those targets. So the next slide, we, um, we just look here now a little bit at the con conceptual foundations. Um, again, those familiar with our corporate work will be familiar with a graphic like this, where we look at uh, the overall emissions trend over time uh, and the positive emissions, and then indeed this neutralization component. When establishing the conceptual framework for financial institution, we followed a similar model, but we added a crucial uh, additional pathway, which is on portfolio alignment. And this reflects the crucial role of financial institutions in increasing the share of their financial flows that are going towards entities and activities that are transitioning along 1.5 pathway. So really, you know, reflecting our theory of change to get the financial sector to engage and influence the real economy uh, to transition along those 1.5 pathways. So as part of this, then we've looked at four different steps that we think are necessary um, when establishing these targets. The first, you know, are those crucial uh, near-term targets. And the primary goal of these targets is to increase the share of those financial flows um, that are going towards companies and activities in the economy that are 1.5 degree aligned. So this means, you know, to, to increase the lending or the investing and indeed also capital markets activities and eventually insurance activities as well that are going towards uh, transition in the real economy. The long-term targets then, there's sort of two core elements of long-term targets, both on the alignment and the emissions front. For the alignment, long-term targets represent that by 2050, essentially all financial flows should be net zero aligned in order for a financial institution to make uh, a net zero claim. And this should be complemented then with those long-term emission targets to bring um, residual portfolio emissions uh, down to that down to that level uh, and then to complement this with neutralization. So before an FI can make that final net zero claim, they will have to ensure that all residual portfolio emissions are neutralized by an equivalent amount of carbon dioxide. Um, so when we established that, uh, that kind of framework, we looked at five different types of criteria that we think are necessary to make sure these targets are robust uh, and transparent. Um, the first is on organization and portfolio target boundary. This represents the scope of the different types of financial flows that should be considered and how they should be prioritized over time. We then have also established criteria on near-term and long-term targets, which address things like the types of targets that should be set, the granularity, uh, and indeed then the different ambition rates expected uh, over near and long-term timeframes. 
We have explicit criteria then on fossil fuel finance, and, and Nate will discuss this uh, shortly. But this is to ensure then that you know the fossil fuel financing does not undermine the additional near and long term targets that uh, institutions are establishing. And then we have finally have criteria on monitoring, reporting, and recalculation, which looks at the quality criteria of the data that's expected when establishing those targets, and indeed then the expectations around disclosure and reporting. Uh, to ensure added transparency and tracking over time. So just to just to a reminder that what's really captured as part of this uh, draft is those core requirements, and we are working in parallel on, on things like those metrics, um, which will be obviously added into to complete the picture. Um, so in the next few slides, I just want to very briefly touch on uh, some of those core criteria and kind of highlight some of the key areas of feedback that we're looking for. So first on that on that key point of establishing the boundary and the coverage, um, the three steps then that we, we follow here are very much, you know, following the greenhouse gas protocol to establish a an organizational boundary. And then within the different emission scopes, we very much see scope one and two and scope three category one to 14 as following our uh, already published uh, corporate net zero standard. So this piece of work really only um, looks at those scope three category 15, the financed and facilitated emissions of financial institutions. And within that, then we are looking here to establish what are the, the scope of financial flows that should eventually be considered within a net zero target. Uh, and we've looked at two main principles uh, to assess this. One on the principle of influence, you know, does the financial institution have influence over the particular uh, financial flows uh, that are in their portfolio? And then does a credible greenhouse gas accounting framework and also a credible target setting method exist in order for you to actually uh, align that financial flow? And we know now, for example, there's many asset classes and different types of financial flows where we don't have methods yet. So we cannot obviously address them now, but hopefully in future, as methods emerge, they will be able to be addressed as well. Um, so the next slide then just details that once we have defined um, the, the scope of the different types of financial flows that we expect to be addressed over time, the next question is how do you prioritize those and how do you set specific uh, boundaries around coverage? Um, what we've done in the past at the SPGI is we've applied a very prescriptive asset class based approach which identified specific coverage thresholds per asset class and what Howard had discussed earlier kind of details many of those. When looking at the broader net zero target, we are actually looking to introduce a more holistic approach, which allows the concept of materiality to be introduced, which does not exist currently in our framework. And this helps us to understand which of those asset classes and other types of financial flows are most material and most climate relevant. Um, in order for us to actually implement this, and there's a big appetite from many institutions that we speak to and, and other, other actors, is to have much more uh, greenhouse gas accounting information disclosed as part of the target setting process. So the expectation is the financial institution should then disclose a full emissions inventory of financed and facilitated emissions. And that can then help identify which types of financial flows are actually climate relevant and should be the focus of target setting and addressing those over time. As part of this element of, of climate relevance, then we have also identified a number of financial flows that should always be considered climate relevant, regardless of their share in a portfolio. Things like obviously like fossil fuel financing, power generation, other financing to high emitting sectors, even if they represent a small share of the portfolio or a small share of emissions, they're clearly climate relevant and we do need financial institutions to also uh, address those. So this is a crucial area and I think we are looking to kind of get some feedback on this updated approach to coverage. Um, in terms of then the actual near-term and long-term targets, on the near-term targets, um, as I mentioned before, the primary goal here is to increase the share of financial flows that are going towards 1.5 C aligned activities. Um, as part of the criteria we've established here is looking also at the difference between alignment targets and emission targets in the near term, and also the different types of granularity that we expect. So we have outlined a few criteria on that. For those long-term targets, then one of the crucial questions we have on long-term alignment is the overall share of the portfolio expected to be aligned uh, by 2050, and whether this should be 100%, so essentially all financial flows, or slightly less than 100% than down to 90%. You'll find in the draft we have uh, more description and background on where these percentages have come from and justifications of, of what that final end stage should look like and the expectations on financial institutions. Um, for then the long-term emissions targets as well, the expectation is that long-term emission targets will have to be established to bring overall financed and facilitated emissions across all uh, scopes of portfolio holdings 
down to uh, residual levels by 2050. And then this then is, is sort of all finalized with this concept of portfolio neutralization. So neutralization as a concept was first introduced in our uh, corporate net zero standard work. And we have borrowed a lot of that thinking here, but complemented a little bit uh, with its application to financial portfolios. Um, the, the primary aim here is that any um, residual emissions in a portfolio, which represent the unabated emissions of portfolio holdings, do need to be neutralized by 2050 in order for the FI to make uh, a net zero claim. Um, and there's three key elements of, of, of neutralization that we are looking um, to get feedback as part of this process. The first on neutralization responsibility and which entity should be responsible uh, for neutralizing uh, emissions, whether they should be the companies themselves in the portfolio or whether under what conditions a financial institution can step in and neutralize on behalf of those companies. Uh, we also have neutralization eligibility, which focus on the types of activities that should actually count towards neutralization and whether that is a balancing of positive and negative you know, finance and facilitated emissions in the portfolio or whether that should also extend in certain cases to um, financial institutions using um, high quality carbon removal credits and whether they are also a suitable uh, mechanism for also neutralizing uh, portfolio emissions. And the final element then is on this on neutralization boundary, which looks at when we uh, do the final balancing of positive and negative emissions, um, are there specific boundaries that we should establish either at the sector level or at the asset class level within a portfolio or indeed other types of boundaries. So that's a, an area that we're, we're looking to explore a bit further um, in this consultation. So I'll just conclude here with saying that you know we have um, a lot more you know background obviously in the consultation and some key questions on those topics. Uh, the QR code here, of course, will take you straight to that survey. Uh, we also have some options here for other general feedback on on elements that you think are not addressed at this point and you think should be addressed as part of this process. So we're also you know very curious to hear any other thoughts you might have. Um, but with that, I'll hand you uh, back to Nate to go into more detail on the fossil fuel side. Wonderful. Thank you, Owen. And uh, again, we hope and invite all of the webinar participants to, to join the survey and tell us what you think. Uh, it's, that's very helpful for us. Um, but also appreciate all the questions that are coming in and um, we're doing our best to, to answer them. So thank you for, for everyone's engagement. Um, so for the fossil fuel part here, it's um, uh, been the position of SPTI since we launched that we're just focused on emission reductions that need to happen at the target setting entity to align with the Paris Agreement. And that's been um, our, our role uh, since we launched eight years ago. Um, and we've always had the understanding that the target setting entity has the best knowledge of the mitigation options that are available to it in terms of technology, what uh, fits in with their financial situation, et cetera. And as such, we haven't specified fuels or technologies at all, but it's become clear that for financial institutions, there's a need to have more specification around fossil fuel investment lending and facilitation activities if these are actually going to be robust and credible targets. Uh, this week, we've had news that we have had the warmest days on record globally uh, this Monday, and then that record was exceeded already on Tuesday. Uh, and so the urgency of, of this work has been underscored uh, and that's part of what's driving us in this area. So this fossil fuel finance position paper lays out um, some initial criteria. Again, this is a consultation draft. So um, it's for feedback from all of you, but uh, it addresses coal, oil, and natural gas and provides explicit criteria it serves, as Howard mentions, as sort of a, a fourth method for um, financial institutions to address their fossil fuel related investment lending and facilitation activities. And, um, you know, our thinking is that this will be required for net zero financial institutions to have credible targets that are uh, assessed by SBTI. So the next slide gives an overview of the uh, the four steps that we have proposed in this draft. Uh, the first is disclosure of all fossil fuel related investment lending and facilitation activities. Uh, and this refers to coal, oil, and gas. The second is arresting any new unabated capacity. 
So uh, that's a key point here is that this is not saying that financial institutions are expected or required to divest from their fossil fuel activities. The point is there has to be no new investment in unabated fossil fuels. And uh, that's how climate change works is that the more we take out from under the ground and burn and put into our atmosphere, the more climate change we have. So to stop that climate change and that warming that we're seeing this week, we need to stop putting those greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And so that's part of the idea here is we stop doing that, stop adding more capacity. And for a financial institution to be net zero, they have to do that unequivocally. Uh, there's no space in any of the scenarios for unabated capacity reductions. Uh, and so that's, that's a clear requirement here. Um, the third thing is transition. Uh, and so <clears throat> the idea is that many financial institutions have lots of financial uh, holdings with fossil fuel companies and that those are um, going to continue to be held and they have to be addressed to transition to a 1.5 degree pathway. And so um, this part of the criteria provides um, guidance for how that transition should look. And generally it includes absolute intensity and CapEx targets at the fossil fuel company level. I'll elaborate on this in a subsequent slide. And then finally, for those fossil fuel assets that don't transition, uh, that continue the status quo, obviously we can't, we can't hold that if we're ever gonna stabilize our climate. And so the idea is there does have to be some phase out of those obsolete facilities and capacity. Uh, and so this fourth set of requirements guides that phase out requirement. And you can see that we've differentiated between coal, oil, and gas. And we also have geographical differentiation across different countries that I'll elaborate on in a subsequent slide. Of course, all of this is in much more detail in the document that we've shared, but uh, I'll just give a bit more of an overview before we go to Q&A. So for the first two, for disclose and arrest, um, there's basically three types of disclosure that we have proposed to require in this draft. The first is absolute finance and facilitated emissions associated with the fossil fuel asset or activity. Uh, and so this is scope one, two, and three emissions. Uh, from the financial institution's perspective. And these data have become much more available in the three years since we launched the framework. Uh, and so there are some groups that already collect and publish these data, but there's a need for the financial institutions to include it in any credible science-based target here is our thinking. The second is basically the same data, but from a financial perspective. And again, there are various groups that already collect these data for banks and other financial institutions, but um, having it in one place from the financial institution itself is the idea here. And then the third component is just a transition plan. As many of you know, GFANS has been doing a lot of work on transition plans among other groups, and uh, it's good work that SPTI is keen to, to build on. Um, and in this case, you know what we're proposing is not that SPTI will... Uh, rewrite or assess these transition plans, but just that that public transition plan be included as part of any credible disclosure from a financial institution. Step two is arrest. So um, again, this is this is clear with the climate scenarios and just the basics of climate science here. Um, but the idea is that there's no new unabated coal projects or funding of unabated coal companies. And likewise with oil and gas, oil and gas has much more complex value chains generally. Uh, and so um, we've specified this in the criteria draft, but the idea is that this would go into effect immediately upon publication of the financial institution's SPT. So once there is a public SPT with this financial institution, there's no more investment in new unabated capacity. The next slide, uh, thanks, goes. Um, into the details for transition, where this is a complex area in terms of how you measure fossil fuel assets alignment with the Paris Agreement, partially because there are different scenarios that have different technology deployment and different assumptions, um, but also because so far, most of the financial institutions have only really addressed this at the portfolio level to say, um, you know, this is this is their target or framing. And so what we're doing here is we're 
linking that portfolio level thinking of the financial institutions with company level targets for their fossil fuel counterparts, counterparties rather. Uh, and so, um, as I said, the idea here is that the companies can demonstrate their transition and Paris alignment with absolute scope one, two, and three targets, intensity targets, and CapEx targets that are demonstrably aligned with a published 1.5 degree pathway that has low and no overshoot. And SPTI has previously published which scenarios uh, are included in that group, and we can provide additional guidance in terms of what's included there and what's not. So that's the transition requirement. And then finally, for phase out, for those assets that um, exist in the financial institutions portfolios and are not transitioning effectively uh, and are unabated, then we've broken it into, as you can see here, three groups of countries with an eye towards uh, development and just transition imperatives. We have required the most aggressive and ambitious requirements among the wealthiest countries. And we have a, a full breakout of which countries are in which group. Um, but basically the requirement here is phase out of all existing flows to unabated coal projects by the end of this decade. And uh, the output of oil and gas and corresponding emissions uh, unabated emissions need to be cut by 75% by 2030 with complete phase out by 2034. For middle income countries, um, similar phase out of coal this decade with output of oil and gas being reduced by 28% this decade and elimination by 2043. For low income countries with the recognition that many low income countries rely more heavily on coal and again with the eye towards just transition and development imperatives, the requirement here that we're proposing is reduction of coal exposure by 50% this decade and exit by the end of 2040, and reduction of oil and gas related emissions by 14% this decade and elimination by 2050. These pathways uh, are a different way of divvying up the carbon budget associated with a 1.5 degree uh, climate stabilization scenario. This builds on work um, by the Tyndall Center in the UK, and it is uh, the reference that, that we're using for consultation here. As with all of our work uh, here, you know, these are initial ideas, and we look forward to the feedback of all of the different stakeholders that are participating in this process. Again, there's the uh, QR code with, uh, with a link to the survey, and these are some of the key topics that, um, that are covered in the survey. In addition to to this webinar today and the survey, we're planning to do additional um, engagement with all of you on each of these three papers that will be more in-depth and detailed. So stay tuned for, um, for those. Those will be circulated via our stakeholder engagement list uh, on SPTI. And um, that'll be also an opportunity to get into some more of the details for each of these three documents. But in the meantime, uh, I think we have some time today for some additional Q&A, but before, yeah, we'll, I'll pass it over to Hasina to, to do that. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Owen, Howard, and Nate for your presentation. Uh, we hope that you have found the information we've provided useful. Um, so we've received a lot of interesting questions today and some have been answered in the chat in the background. So uh, moving on to some questions. Um, one of the questions we had, uh, this is for Nate. Is the fossil fuel finance paper going to be a requirement for SPTI sign up or is it an option? For example, if an FI sets a temperature rating target, will they still need to comply with the fossil fuel finance criteria? Yeah, thank you for the question. It's a good one. Uh, so in the meantime, what we have now is temperature rating and that will continue to be available. Uh, we want, it's an option, as, as Howard mentioned, um, in the near term, but eventually we see this becoming a requirement. So it's just sort of a matter of time here, but there will be a transition as we've described elsewhere. Generally, the sort of phase in period that we use is six months, but um, uh, we'll see how this goes in terms of the consultation period as well. Thanks, Nate. Um, so the next question is for Owen. Uh, do you expect pushback on the scope three category 15 approach, considering several uh, several banks have pushed back against 
attributing a large portion of facilitated emissions to a bank, which has seemingly delayed the release of PCAP standards uh, for facilitated emissions. Thanks, Ina. It's, it's an excellent question. I mean, so we're working quite closely with PCAF on, on that concept of um, facilitated emissions. And obviously, you know, SPGI is not an accounting standard, so we are we are looking, you know, to advise on that. Um, for us, when it, on the concept of facilitated emissions and the concept of, of a more holistic approach to coverage, when we're talking about net zero targets and reaching net zero emissions, they will have to eventually cover all of those financial flows that have a climate impact. And certainly those facilitating activities uh, have have those um, climate impact. So we are, you know, waiting on the outcome of that, um, but we're very much, you know, keeping a close eye on it. It's also, it's also important to um, understand when we talk about a holistic approach to coverage, the key element here is materiality. And it's not expecting all uh, financial asset classes and, and activities be covered immediately. It will always be that phasing approach where we want to focus on those activities that are responsible for the largest share of emissions first, which will be obviously from key high emitting sectors, and then increasing that over time. So, as we see with our current framework and how you know institutions are, are you know focusing on a gradual increase in engagement and building up the overall share of their portfolios that are one point five aligned, we would expect the same with with facilitated activities and such as capital markets underwriting. Right. Thanks, Owen. Um, another question is. Uh, would it be possible to set targets using the new portfolio alignment based approach that is introduced in the FINS consultation document only, or would it have to be used together with another approach, um, temperature rating, SDA or SVTI coverage? Yeah, not, not a good question. So the portfolio alignment approach that we mentioned is really just a a way to um, articulate the types of methods that, could, that will actually count. So on our portfolio alignment, we'll look at a broader range of forward-looking metrics that we can use to determine, you know, if the entities or the activities you're investing or lending to, um, or insuring, for example, or, or underwriting, um, are actually 1.5 aligned. You know, portfolio coverage, temperature rating are clearly forward-looking metrics that would, you know, fall under that approach. And we're then looking at SDA and other types of methods as well to see how they will feature in that. So that piece of work is actually happening now in parallel. And we are hoping kind of to publish an update on that shortly, which will include also some of the feedback from this process. And that will really clarify, you know, what counts over time in terms of uh, alignment metrics. Um, and, you know, we have three methods currently that we, we use in our framework. We acknowledge that, you know, since the three years that we've published that many, many new methods have been developed and a lot of interesting work has, has been undertaken. So we want to take kind of a step back and a broad review of that and see what other types of approaches that we can actually capture uh, and try to also take advantage of the good work that's been done uh, by many others. Okay, great. Thanks, Owen. Uh, for Nate, how are avoided emissions addressed by the frameworks? Yeah, thank you. This has been a perpetual question for SPTI. Uh, and um, generally, we've not included any avoided emissions, just simply for the reason that there's no consistent counterfactual baseline for assessing the emissions impact of any particular product uh, or category. It's clear that, for example, insulation or renewable technologies do play a positive role here in reducing emissions, uh, and we're not denying that. It's just an issue of, again, having a clear counterfactual baseline and maintaining the most consistent, clear accounting approaches. And within the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, which is our, our foundation here, um, there's been you know some thinking about how to do emissions uh, accounting for avoided emissions over the years. But again, it just, it comes down to that lack of, of baseline. So um, for this new work, especially what Owen's been describing with the alignment orientation, uh, it does take us into new territory. It's not just strictly an emission reduction target. Uh, and so I think that, you know, the EU taxonomy and other references are going to become more germane for SPTI as we move into this space. Uh, and it's something that we're thinking about but I'm not expecting that we'll have any particular sort of avoid emissions acknowledgement or accreditation anytime soon. But uh, I'll pause here to see if Owen has anything to add on the FINS angle. Yeah, thanks, Nate. I mean, there is a, there's a big appetite, of course, for financial sector SBTs to 
also be more consistent with things like taxonomies and transition finance, green financing uh, type approaches that are that have been developed. So we are looking under the Finns approach to understand, you know, how do we also have methods that incentivize, you know, the financing of these climate solution activities, um, which again, you know, traditionally won't set SBTs, for example. Um, so we will also be looking at a broader set of metrics uh, that will help us to sort of redirect financial flows into those activities that are net zero aligned or that are clearly contributing to um, uh, to, to net zero economy. Avoided emissions obviously is a common metric, uh, and we will be kind of assessing that alongside you know a number of others as well to see um, if it is stable and robust. The key element of, always for SPTI is that you know are the indicators that are used to the targets robust over time, or are they can they be easily manipulated and so on? Because these have to be applied across very very wide range of, of entities in different kind of geographies so we want to make sure that there is consistency and standardization as well uh great thanks uh owen um nate there's another question about fossil fuels so is there any recourse for fis other than the phase out if um the fossil fuel companies in question has a net zero plan but it's not making sufficient progress in reaching those targets and who decides what is reasonable progress that's a great question uh and um i think that it gets to some of the larger debates here where in spti we fully recognize that there's a need for additional investment and engagement of fossil fuel companies to achieve 1.5 degree um, stabilization that we can't just walk away and divestment is not the first best option. Um, so we we fully agree with that. In this scenario that the, the question is describing where the fossil fuel company has set a net zero target, they have a transition plan, and for whatever reason, they're not making sufficient progress, I guess the question is, what's happening? You know, is it is it that they, you know, have done the capex investment and you know they've installed for example wind and solar but the capacity factors for these assets are too low and therefore they're having to to supplement with gas or is it that they haven't made the investments i mean i think it gets complicated quickly but generally within sbti we don't have the the resources to assess individual situations like this and so what we're expecting to provide is a basic quantitative threshold for this kind of assessment. Um, and you know, that's sort of the point at which we can we can say that there's some kind of alignment. But um, where there's sort of some progress but not enough, it's a tough call. Um, and I think this is something where there is some some debate, and you know, we are open to a range of views here in terms of what makes sense from different stakeholders and financial institutions. So uh, you'll see in the details of, of these three documents, we've tried to accommodate for you know, the rollover of different financing mechanisms and sort of the practicalities of this from a financial institution perspective. Um, but there are a lot of these edge cases where um, you know, we want to help to move things in the right direction. Um, but we, you know, we want this to be actionable and robust, and obviously linked to the climate science. You know, that's kind of our role here. So, um, balancing those imperatives is something that that we're working with all of you on doing through this consultation process. So, I think that's a it's a really good example of an edge case question where, um, you know, we we seek to work with all of you on on how that is best implemented because it's not entirely clear to us yet. Great, thanks, Nate. Um, so for Owen, beyond target disclosure, will there be a contemplated framework in order to track actual completion or fail to reach delay slash delayed validation targets? Thanks, Nate. Yeah, I mean, similar similar to Nate's uh, answer as well. So we have an MRV track that's that's undergoing um, uh, work at the moment at at SPGI, which is primarily focused on corporate targets and you know what constitutes a 1.5 c aligned uh, reduction you know in terms of change in greenhouse gas emissions and boundary changes and so on um so we will be undertaking the same thing for portfolios um in the current uh draft fin standard we have included some criteria around the types of reporting we expect to aid in our understanding of the progress and one of those critical ones is attribution reporting 
Um, and this is really designed um, to have more transparency on why these metrics are actually changing over time. So, you know, a financial institution reduces its finance emissions from, you know, A to B. What caused that change? Was it portfolio shifting? Was it improvement in the underlying companies and so on? So we are trying to add more nuance in the reporting, um, but ultimately the goal will be to have a kind of a more structured MRV process in place where we will be able to identify and say, you know, when is an FI on track or not? Um, typically that cannot be done on an annual basis because obviously these targets are rarely met in a linear fashion and it can take a number of years to actually understand, um, you know, what does on track actually mean. So, but we are working closely on that and I think there's a big appetite as well uh, to, uh, you know, eventually, you know, targets are really only the first step, but the, 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 the important element is actually performance against those targets. So that will be, a, you know, a crucial area for SPGI going forward. Okay, thanks so much, Owen and Nate. Um, so I'll leave it to Nate to make some closing statements. Yep. Great. Um, well, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, everyone, for, for presenting. Just in terms of some next steps, so we're just about in the middle of this 60-day public consultation period. It closes on the 14th of August, and um, again, we would really welcome everyone completing that stakeholder survey. If you have questions about it um, or any of the things that we've mentioned today, we also have our online forum where we encourage you to, um, to submit your questions or see if someone else has submitted the same question that's already been answered. Uh, or if you have any other feedback, welcome that via the forum or emailing us. Um, we will, as I said, also have deep dives on each of these three resources. And so um, we welcome you to join those conversations. Uh, and obviously this is this is an ongoing process. And so um, you know, we're seeking to, to build this group of um, financial institutions that are demonstrating best practice with their science-based targets and really define what that means for net zero for financial institutions. Because right now it's obviously uh, a bit scattered in terms of the details of what financial institutions mean when they say net zero. And so that's really our intention here is to bring some standardization to this, this area. Um, yeah, in the meantime, we appreciate all of your participation and um, we look forward to following up with, with everyone who joined today. Thanks again.